All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special series of Contra Thoughts I'm doing here with the Vody Bauckham's book. This is doing chapter nine. I've got a guest, special guest. Uh, I'm a fan of his channel on YouTube, Tim Frisch from The First Perspective. Why don't you introduce yourself, Tim, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, this is my channel. As you said, a Frisch Perspective. There we go. My last name is Frisch. <laughs> and Frisch uh, in German means Jeff, uh, means Jeff, means fresh. And uh, so it really fits, you know, the idea that you uh, are having a fresh perspective or fresh perspective, depending on how you want to look at it. But it is my perspective on things. I always say that I give analysis of different subjects, reviews. I do a lot of Bible reviews. If anybody watches my channel, they'll know that. Mm -hmm. And I also just try to have fun to just do some things that I think are hopefully in a way entertaining, but thoughtful as well. Yep. So I started that channel back in 2018. Yes. And then, uh, you know, it kind of, it took me a long time to really get anywhere at all with it. But uh, COVID actually helped a lot because people were, you know, the world was kind of exploding and people were, I think, even watching more stuff like, like some of the things I was talking about on my channel. So that... <laughs> Even though a lot of hard things about the COVID situation, everything that's gone on the last couple of years, uh, it's actually helped my channel to grow and build an audience. So. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Well, thanks for joining me. I know you wear hats a lot of times, and I was talk talking to you briefly. I've got a hat on. I don't normally wear hats, but uh, I'm a Dodger fan. And are you are you a Red Sox fan, like officially? Because I know you collect all the hats. Um, I live in. New Hampshire. I live in New England. So that is the home team. And many people up here are diehard Red Sox fans. So I, I, I do like the Red Sox, but you know, to be honest, I like the Dodgers as well because my dad uh, is a lifelong Dodgers fan. He wasn't from LA or Brooklyn or anything, but when he was young, he would listen, I guess, to Dodgers games mm. and he just really got attached to them. And so I like the Dodgers kind of like I like the Red Sox. They're kind of a second tier team for me. But my favorite team is where I where I grew up, where I would go to games, which is the Philadelphia Phillies. Oh, OK. Nice. That's right. I think I've, I think I've seen you talk about the Phillies before. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. That's good. I definitely well, talk about them. <laughs> um, well, we are doing, like I said, we're doing chapter nine. Uh, my wife found the book cover and she's like, you got to put it back on. I was using and reading it without it. She's like, either put it back on or we're throwing it away. So I put it back on. Um, is there anything that struck, struck you right away, kind of right off the bat you want to, you want to touch on? Um, yeah, there, there were actually some things that uh, he said that really did stick out to me. See if I can find anything here. I think um, one of the major things that jumped out is, he, he does get into politics in this chapter mm -hmm. and and even in other parts of the book. But but here he really, I think, hits on some things, which is interesting. And he says, unlike the the black people in the church voting for Obama, white evangelicals voting for Trump in 2016 was a fault line. So when he's talking about the fault lines in this book, he's trying to identify different things happening in our culture Mm -hmm. But one of the bellwethers that he points out here is Trump being voted on. And what I kind of hear him saying is that when the white evangelicals voted for Trump, that's when you really saw the crack kind of appear. Uh, that's that's when people really started to take sides, so to speak. Uh, and and especially from the from where he's describing here, some of the African American perspective or the black perspective was they felt kind of betrayed is 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 kind of how he described some of the things they wrote he gives the examples of jamar tisby and tabidi abueli uh, or anya abueli mm -hmm. and so you know th that definitely jumped out at me um the idea that trump uh in that whole election <laughs> brought about uh you know a real fault line and i think people have a lot of strong opinions about that yeah there's no doubt about it yeah yeah th that's definitely <clears throat> that's a good thing to lead off on because there is i think a lot of folks don't really either want to acknowledge what what has happened and been happening 
or they want to think it's so new that like, well, we weren't racist because we voted for Obama, but then we voted for Trump and now we're racist again. And it's like, uh, no, that's not really correct at all. Now, I mean, sure, some people are and there obviously is still actual animus and hatred for people. And that's you know what really racism is. But I think his point, especially early on, is where they change a lot of you know earlier in the book, they change a lot of the descriptions. And they talk about, you know, racism is now you know, having less melanin <laughs> or being from Western Europe or, you know, having showing up on time to work or something like that. And you're like, excuse me, like that's not even remotely racist. That's just being responsible. Uh, and he touches on that uh, in chapter eight and some in chapter nine as well with personal responsibility. Um, yeah, the things that... Um, Page 179. So he, he uses the analogy, which I like. And if people who are watching following along, uh, obviously it's called fault lines being from the West as he is. I am yeah, in the East. There's not as many earthquakes, but the West there definitely is. And of course, a fault line. He's using a lot of that analogy with with um, aftershocks and, and all the rest. And he kind of continues that here. And that's the name of this aftershock. Uh, he hits on. What is it? The 179. There's four kind of characteristics. Um, well, he exposes a little bit and, and, and talks about social work and how a lot of people who are, quote unquote, oppressed, whether they have more melanin or whether they are part of, you know, the alphabet LGBT people or they're, you know, an immigrant. Everybody just kind of gets lumped in together, which I find so strange. Uh, and I probably because there's a lot of disparate groups that don't have quote unquote a voice and therefore they want to just kind of lump everybody together and we have strength in numbers. Um, but he says in uh, 179, 180, there's the hege hegemony, oppressor, oppressed paradigm, number three, Gnostic priests, and number four, enlightened saviors. And that really, I think, sums up, I think for a lot of people watching. Um, and if you're kind of like, ah, what's this about? This is probably one of the best chapters, I think, to read, to really get right to the heart of the issue, at least. Um, I mean, I've read everything but the last two chapters now, and I would say this is probably the most not only revealing, but direct and clear chapter. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the hegemony <clears throat> of showing basically that there's this power structure that's been erected by people that look like you and me and all of a sudden we're using all these mechanisms to keep people down and one of those then is kind of this subset of oppressor oppressed and if you're oppressor you can never be oppressed and if you're oppressed you can never be the oppressor kind of like the old like well black people can't be racist blah 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 um gnostic priest talking about experiential stuff which is of course standpoint epistemology where you're just your epistemology your knowledge of something but it's your perspective, not the Bible, not the truth, not even truth in general, just somebody's perspective. And then he talks about the, the oppressor um, class who are exempt. And this again goes, and I think Jason said it uh, when we talked a while back about it, Whitaker, in um, he had said, like, because of my more melanin content, I'm now exempt from XYZ sin or cultural whatever. And therefore, I don't actually need a savior. And that's, you know, you tease this out. That's where a lot of this goes. I mean, you listen to some of these guys, Jamar Tisby or Ibram X. Kendi, and uh, that's really kind of what it sounds like a lot of times where there's just this, yeah, I don't I don't really need that, actually. Now, they don't ever say it, but that's, you know, you take it to its logical end. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on those four points there? Um. Well, I think one of the things that comes to my mind, and, and a lot of this, I would say, again, is rooted in the, you know, in our context, which is, it is very political. There's no doubt about it. And I would say that in America, the, the right and the left function in a certain way here. And it's interesting, if you talk to Christians in Europe, they don't always see things exactly the same. But that's because it is a slightly different context. But there's no doubt about it. We tend to export ideology <laughs> in America. So the things that we're dealing with here are actually, you know, uh, being now pur purported and being uh, grappled with across 
across the oceans. And it's interesting to see um, how that plays out. But yeah, the, the hegemony, oppressor, oppressed prag paradigm, the Gnostic priests, enlightened saviors. I mean, a lot of that gets back into some, I, I would say, some political tendencies yeah. on the left. And by the way, before I even say any more about that, I, I think probably a weakness I feel in this book, and I understand why it's happening. He's he's a he's a, a man who, you know, he's a black man who grew up uh, with those experiences. And he's actually speaking very much to the people who might be more drawn to the left yeah. uh, politically. Yeah. And therefore, he, he hits a lot on that and and almost downplays any issues on the right. So I do want to say that I think there's certainly things you could spend a lot of time and we should spend time talking about uh, about the right and looking at everything through a biblical lens, right or left. But yeah. no doubt about it, on the left, you have built into some of their ways of operating and some of their fundamental reasons for being has to do with oppression. They, they've always been championing, champion, you know what I'm trying to say. They're trying to be a champion for those who are disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that first of all, if there's not a problem, they're going to have a tendency to, to want there to be a problem in, in that way, because that's why they exist. You know? <laughs> but also that umbrella is going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, who's oppressed, right? Well, hey, there's this group that feels disenfranchised. There's that group. So that certainly, and as far as being a savior, I mean, that's just a, you know, we as humans want to feel needed and feel like we're doing something good. And unfortunately, it's it's that idolatrous tendency that we want to be the savior rather yeah. than point people to the, to the savior, you know, and recognize our need and think of ourselves as being the answer rather right. than realizing we're all part of the problem because of our sin. So, yeah, there's a lot there. And I actually think it exposes some of the tendencies and weaknesses that you do see on the political left. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, the, the double speak is pretty astounding with with the left. I mean, the right, of course, does it, too. But of course, this is a book about the left. And, you know, they'll get people got mad. And he brings that up about, you know, you voted for Trump, not because Hillary's a crook or because of corruption or because she was already basically in the White House in the 90s with her husband or because of high taxes or she wants to remove the Hyde Amendment or she's full on just a clone of Obama or like all this other stuff. It's because you're racist. And it's like, really? Because you actually said you were voting for not you, but uh, for Obama because he was that. And it's like, I thought we were all about not people's skin color back in 2008. I mean, I remember that. And I, all the stuff about him being a Marxist and being uh, a socialist, that was taboo and kind of weird. And uh, and now it's like obvious. <laughs> and now it's like, you, then you have a few years later, Bernie Sanders, right? And, and others who, uh, you know, you just kind of open that door that much more and mm -hmm. it, it's where we're at. And yeah, they just have to kind of keep pushing it, which is just pretty fascinating. But the thing he, he really hits on hard is abortion, you know, and that's in 81 to the next few pages. Um, mm -hmm. And he goes through both the, the Democratic Party's um, platform on abortion, removing the Hyde Amendment, having no barrier, full access to reproductive health. Of course, they don't call it murder. They don't call it abortion. They don't call it ending, killing a baby. They don't call it anything like that because they want to obfuscate. And then the Republican platform is we would support human life amendment. Uh, we oppose the use of public funds to perform abortion, like Planned Parenthood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we will not fund or subsidize health care that includes abortion coverage. So, you know, I know there's different debates within abortion and the, the quote unquote pro-life movement of abolition versus slowly and this and that. And not to make that a single issue, although he does touch on that being a single voter issue. Um, <laughs> he he really does pull the feet to the fire. And, you know, kind of drag their feet over and say, no, this is what we're going to look at. And I think a lot of people. Yeah, one, one of the reasons I think he he points that out is. And again, this is where we all have to be careful about uh, being unequally yoked. 
mm-hmm. the scripture says. And when it comes to politics, I, I, I think as Christians in America, we should be engaged on some level in, in our political world, whether that's even through voting. Mm-hmm. But the danger is unequally yoked. And I, I believe that what he what he brings out and that it really bothers him is that the trend among those who have been Democrat historically has been to make abortion less and less of a an issue. In other mm-hmm. words, they've become more and more pro-choice, not only in function, but in ideology. And he's yeah. really hammering uh, on mm-hmm. that issue because of that. He's saying... Look, before you might have said you were pro-life, I think he uses Jesse Jackson as mm-hmm. an example. But now, yeah. now even people like him are getting softer and softer on that issue of abortion. So that's where he's really trying to, I think, bring some clarity and accountability there. Yeah, yeah no, I, that's a good point. Um, yeah, he really <clears throat> he hits through and he goes through several you know, evangelicals so-called, um, and really hits on after Jesse Jackson in 182 and 183, he mentions uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, which, of course, most conservative traditional Catholics do not like. He's very leftist. I don't follow that much. But uh, And then you have another guy, in, <clears throat> a bishop in Texas, and then he goes through a few others, including going through Tim Keller, and then Platt, and uh, some of these other guys that you think, oh, these guys are so solid, you know, but I'll tell you, I mean, it's something that I I, I often have thought and said regarding like atheism. Like a lot of times people will, you know, oh, well, you know, maybe the material, maybe Darwin, maybe this, maybe that, you know, and Christians kind of softening. But no atheist is like, we need to add more Bible to our atheism, right? We don't, we're, we're solid, we're firm on this. And truthfully, you know, the Democratic Party is, is well, not all atheists, of course, but there are a lot and it has bigger attraction. They have similar. They're like, no, we're going to kill babies. We're not going to call it killing babies. We're going to do anything. We're going to we want you to pay for it. No restriction, nothing. You do it. We're going to kill these babies. Like, that's what it is. <laughs> like, it's so harsh. And like, I know maybe somebody's watching like, oh, that's why do you got to talk like that. But the right is like, well, you know, there's different issues and you know, the black community and this and that. It's like, but we're killing babies though. And it's actually talks about, and this is the thing that he really points out that if you include the unborn, the likelihood of you dying in abortion on average, or or, or the, a black person is going to die in abortion more than anything else. If you include the unborn Mm -hmm. and, and Mm -hmm. you know, the BLM, they don't talk about that. They don't talk about old people. They only talk about avatars who are going to, postulate their exact messaging of Marxism and and cultural ideology. And it's just uh, for Christians, again, the world's going to do what it's going to do. And that's part of, you know, why I try and do my channel of at least exposing some of the nonsense, hence even doing this book. But Hmm. as Christians, like, I understand it's quote unquote complicated, but, and we don't need to be jerks, but we are murdering babies. Like you are, you are killing a baby, right? Like, especially if it's, you know, late term abortion and so on. And yet we always want to nuance Tim Keller, he says, and, and Platt and some of these other guys. And well, you know, it's complicated voting for Joe Biden, you know, kind of made sense instead of Trump because of this or that. And it's like, but really? Because like, what are the other issues? I mean, he says here in 190, according to live action, an estimated 2,300, 2,363 preborn children will die in America today. I mean, like, Hmm. Over 2,000 people? I mean, imagine if we, everybody we knew, which is, you know, probably a big network of several hundred, if not maybe up to 1,000. If everybody we knew from church and, you know, probably gets up to 2,000 people from high school or whatever, if they were all dead tomorrow. <laughs> but it, har- it harms us because they have personality. We can, they have a name. We can see their face. But the unborn, they don't get named. We don't see their face. It's all dark. It's all in the calculated evils of abortion and, and, and they want to keep it that way. And yet then they want to decry, you know, people on the right about making it a single issue. And, Oh, why are you always talking about this? Why are you always talking about that? And I just, I don't know. I'm kind of sick of it. Like, it's like you guys are diehard killing babies and that's fine. 
and we say, yeah, we probably should stop doing that. And like, how dare you? And it's like, well, which is right? I mean, according to the scripture, should we, should we not murder? I mean, it's in the Ten Commandments, right? Like, I don't know. It's, hmm. it's something that can <clears throat> work me up pretty quick. But, um, yeah, he mentioned Jim Wallace, Tim Keller. Jim Wallace has historically been very progressive, very left, lifelong Democrat. He says, um, it's I don't know. It's fascinating because you have even tell Tim Keller, and I would disagree with him on a few other issues as well. But kind of acting like, well, you know, there's there's different options for the black community, which I understand it, it, it shouldn't, quote unquote, be just a single voter issue. Uh, but then Bauckham even says that's a straw man, which I would say that's on 190 single voting issue is a straw man. And I would disagree. I would agree because I think most people that are fairly informed um are like, well, I'd rather have lower taxes. I'd rather have less government. I'd rather have, or I'd rather have more programs, or I'd rather have something, you know, minimum wage, $15. Like people think about more things than just abortion, although it is a pretty big deal. I mean, if they were killing 2,300 people every single day, just at gunpoint, I think people would have a problem with that. Right? I mean, like, I feel like everybody would have a problem with that, especially if it was the police. But, you know, I digress. I've been talking a lot. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, with with this whole book, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that that I think could be helpful, uh, especially with some of the counter narratives. That's something that stuck out to me when he was going through stories. You hear about events that are portrayed one way, specifically mm -hmm. through uh, mainstream media outlets, uh, versus all the details of the story, and he really you know, does a good job and even brings up other, other stories you don't hear about and uh, other statistics or other things that might play into the statistics. So, so there's a lot of good here. And even with this, this specific chapter, I don't really have any issue with what he, what he says. I, I will say though, the tricky part, to be honest, is, is what we don't talk about and, and it is part of the, um, it's like Ecclesiastes. There's, there's, there's sometimes a futility in a sin cursed world where no matter what you do, you, you know, you don't, you know, this world is not really your home. I hope we feel that way as Christians, because uh, he says this here, and this is page, um, 193. He says, um, and this is getting back to people voting for Trump. Mm-hmm. He says, I, I say this as someone who supported Ted Cruz in the 2016 primary. I even attended a private Cruz campaign event and lamented the pragmatism of evangelicals who abandon Cruz in favor of Trump. And later on, he goes on to talk about how uh, there are things that Trump does that um, that bother him and even yeah. offend him at times. And so I really think that's the part of this that's very challenging. And I know that, it, and I've been thinking about an analogy, <laughs> but one thing I'll say, uh, just to throw this out there, just if we took away critical race theory in America, it just <laughs> disappeared, mm -hmm. would we be a godly nation? I'm not convinced that's true. That's that's my that's where I'm hurting a, as a Christian right now. Mm. I hope that makes sense. It's like what was the what gave opportunity for something like CRT to actually flourish? It was already the track we were on as America. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I think and, and so that's what I'm saying is with Trump it's the analogy I would use is if you have the cancer, like some of the things happening right now with the progressive stuff and the CRT and, and uh, intersectionality ideologies, Marxism, you could call that a cancer. Mm -hmm. And so what do you need to do? Maybe in this very vital situation, we need to do surgery and we need to get it out. Well, what tool are you going to use? And yeah. to me, our, our political system right now is almost like taking a, a tool that has not been sterilized. 
And it's like, okay, yeah, we're we're trying to get rid of the cancer. And I think Trump, in one sense, was trying to get rid of cancerous yeah, things. Yeah. But I'm not convinced that he was a godly man mm -hmm. who is really all about the glory of Christ. Right. And I think it leaves us in that same feudal situation. Ultimately, we cannot answer things. And I don't think he's trying to say we should answer things through politics. But yeah. I just wish the book, even at these points, would just get us back to the gospel. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. that good news that we all need to be reminded of yeah. and, and also be humbled by. And I guess that's where I'm coming from with all this. And I did say in my review that I didn't think it was a perfect book. But I understand where he's coming from. He, he he's trying to, he's just trying to identify some things that he sees as as really dangerous. And I I don't disagree with him in what he says, in what he points out as problems. But again, where he says here, he's lamenting about the pragmatism of evangelicals. On the right, who who was really supporting Trump? Well, you had people that were probably reluctantly supporting. And probably you and me would fit that category. At least yeah. I can speak for myself and say, you know, by the time the second term came around, I just kind of like, yeah, out of the options that are available, I can see why, you know, Trump might be the better option. Yeah. Um, but there are also people who actually were very supportive of Trump as if he were himself this great savior, so to speak, for yeah. America. And I actually think those Christians on the right, we might identify, for example, some, some of the people who believe in the health and wealth gospel. Well, I don't want to be unequally yoked to them either. Yeah. <laughs> you know no, what I'm saying? True. So that's, so that's where I'm like, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. And I, I, if you're, if you want to attack the left, he's doing a good job of that. Yeah. But we still have some things, you know, as an evangelical church that even aside from these issues, we've got problems. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. I know that's, uh, I thought that too. I mean, watching, I don't know, the last maybe two to three months now with school board meetings and other stuff and people going and reading, you know, from not this book, but you know, Johnny has a boyfriend and it's about how his professors wants to perform sexual acts on the seventh grader and like and they're you know and then they even interrupt and like excuse me you can't read that there's children like this is a children's book this is in the library and like people are like what is going on like that's part mm -hmm. of this and mm -hmm. as christians we must wake up we gotta wake up and i think you know you and me and again i can speak for me i feel like uh, and i know you're a bit older than me but we're we're gonna we're on this tail end of the baby boomers having kids and then gen xers and realizing, oh, shoot, uh, wait, hold on, what? You're teaching what? Because I don't know about you, in the 90s in California, I taught all, I was taught all about materialistic evolution, all about Darwin and all about this and that and the other. And I understand it's a theory. That's not a good argument for the atheists. They don't care about theories or it's not theory. I don't care. The point is, you have zero foundation or ethics or standards yeah. if you're going to adopt Darwin. You just do. Now, they don't ever talk about that, nor does Hitchens or, well, he's dead, but um, Darwin or Darwin. Dawkins, Dawkins, there we go. My favorite atheist, yes. uh, Dr. Dickie D. And um, uh, we share the same name, it's good. But no one was really upset 20 years ago when it's like, excuse me, you're teaching my kid that they came from pond scum? Why are you teaching them? Because evolution won the day. Now this is like a bastard child of evolution in Marxism and, and critical theory. And at least yeah. people are standing up now, but by golly, we should have been standing up 40, 50 years ago uh, when, you know, we weren't even around and say, no, 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 this is wrong. You want to talk about this being a theory? Fine. But don't tell them it's true or it's fact because it ain't. You weren't there. You have no idea. These are dead bones or starlight. You have zero idea how old anything is. You have zero idea how it came to be. You have zero idea the mechanisms on and on and on. So, I mean, that's part of my own Christian testimony in the sense of being fed that lie for years. And then being taught, oh, actually, you can trust the scripture and there's actual answers in the scripture. Um, and that's one of the, I mean, it didn't save me, but it really softened the ground to actually hear the gospel and understand my need for Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, so, again, it's better late than never, I guess. But uh, you're right, because yeah. we had to get to a certain point in, in society to get to accept this.
uh, to a degree. Yes. And, and what we have to understand is happening now is that I'm actually seeing secular people who are very much against wokeism, for example. Yeah. They think it's, it's, it's crazy, but that doesn't mean what they believe is biblical. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. So we're, we're, we're having kind of our own strange bell bedfellows effect happening even as Christians who are trying to resist maybe the mainstream cultural pull towards CRT, for example. Yeah. But there's there's other people. And Trump is a good example of this. I tried to point this out. Yes, from a pragmatic point of view, I understand at the end of the day, especially after the primaries were over, why people voted for him. But Trump, for example, does not have a biblical view about sexuality. Right. He was He was very... You know, when it came to LGBT, he was like, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't really mind that. Right. So, yeah, we do. We have to realize, like, our culture is very, very lost. And one of the things is you mentioned that we should have been fighting. I think Christians have tried to fight over the years. But I would say at our best, Christians don't try to fight spiritual warfare with non-spiritual weapons you know the weapons yeah. of our warfare are spiritual yeah. and that's what we have got to get back to again that's where the health wealth prosperity gospel is so off it's yeah. so materialistic and physically focused and it's like that's the stuff that makes us shallow and weak yeah and it's not biblical right so yeah, yeah i mean i and i i actually think pastor bacham would totally agree with everything we're saying right now uh, so I don't mean to be overly critical yeah. uh, of his book. I'm more being critical of just where American Christianity is at as a whole, regardless of, you know, <laughs> the stuff we're happened to be dealing with in the last five, six years. Right. Yeah, no. And I think, <clears throat> um, yeah, it, I mean, that's a good point because ultimately the gospel is what saves and changes people. And then, and I know I will go back to the gospel, gospel, you know, okay, just preach the gospel. And it's like, yes, but within that is doctrine, right? And what's the doctrine of the church? What's the doctrine of creation? What's the doctrine of salvation? What's the doctrine of the end times? Now, again, I've shifted quite a bit. I don't know about you. Uh, we could talk about it maybe now or another time, but I think the whole pre-trib rapture antichrist, it's been a disaster. It's just been a disaster because not only, you know, Y2K, I mean, we're old enough to remember Y2K. Remember 1999? You're like, what's going to happen, right? The zeros and the ones, and it's going to freak out. And nothing happened, right? Nothing happened. And, well, the, the rapture should be right around the corner and this and that. And you, you know, and this is this is happening in Russia and Saudi Arabia is this. And, and then those people go away. And then it's kind of the next thing. And we're so wanting as the church and i'm you know saying the last 50 to 100 years that's one real big thorn that's been stuck in the church's side secondly that kind of let stuff sink in was was uh materialistic evolution darwinism but i think parents and i know you got even more ch children than me you have eight kids is that right six six okay six kids uh yeah. six we've got four but it's hard work Right. And it's really hard work. And you have to teach your children not only do this and not do that just because I said, but you need to like expose them to a level of like biblical worldview. And not everybody believes like us. And this is what the scripture says. And and God is 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 a forgiving God and he's kind, but he's also uh, uh, wrath. He will pour his wrath on. Sin. Like and there's this like this robust stuff that personal holiness is another one that all these things within the church. I mean, the divorce rate's like the same as the world. Yeah. And it's like, excuse right. me? Like, what the heck? Yeah. So, you know, in one sense, I'm not surprised. I hate it. It sucks. It's terrible. And you or me and everybody else we know can't, you know, do that and fix it or make a bunch more videos and fix it. But I mm -hmm. hope at least something like this is just pushing one more. This book, the book we were talking about, you wrote a little bit. How long? When did you write your book, you said? It was a while ago? It came out like... Uh... End of 2014, beginning of oh, 2015. Okay. So. 
God yeah, Matters. Six well, years ago. if you want a book by Tim Frisch, he wrote, is it God Matters, right? God Matters, yes. The importance of belief in a world of doubt. Yeah, and I do point out in that book that when you don't have God as a foundation, you know from the book of Romans chapter 1, yeah. once people don't acknowledge God, even though they know he's there, they don't acknowledge him, they're ungrateful, they begin to worship things other than God, and it's a downhill spiral from there. And so that's certainly what I I believe we're seeing very starkly right now in the West in general. Yeah. And that's why I said, even if you got rid of social justice theory right now, it just disappeared and no one believed that, I'm not convinced we'd be in a good place because- it would be Go ahead. Sorry. We're already secularized. Yeah. We're we're already, you know, yeah. we don't depend on God. We're not humble. All of those yeah. things. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's 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 a really that's an excellent point because yeah, the Democrats, yeah, the Republicans, um, you know, there there are I think I think voting's important. Uh it's it's weird because sometimes, you know, people will go back and they'll go to the Bible or this or that. And it's like, well, voting wasn't an issue, though. They didn't get to vote, right? They didn't have a democratic republic. We were actually the government, right? And most people kind of forget that, especially when they just spout out Romans 13 as if we're supposed to do whatever the government says. Um, and, yeah. and, and all that. And it's like, but why are we here to begin with? You know, how did we get here? There's a lot of long quotes I'm just kind of looking at here. Um, because, yeah, it's like you're bleeding out. You know, and and there's a new wound called critical race theory, and you're losing a ton of blood. And if you syringe that, cut that, all right, now let's carot it, you know, put the whole heat and whatever they got to do to like really stop severe bleeding. There's still other spots that were bleeding, and we've had serious brain damage. And like, there's a lot of right. just crap, just junk. And honestly, yes, it's the world, but it's the church, you know, and, and right. like Israel in so many ways. The church um, gathered together, worshiping Christ, hasn't really hasn't really been the best, you know, because people have such a weird idea about how you get saved. You got to keep the law, you know. You got to be, and it's like, no, hold on, yeah. you know, you got to be moral. Well, no, hold on, you got to wear a one piece and not a two piece. You got to not have a beard. You got to have a beard. You got to, and it's like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, and that's what the world thinks because they heard that at VBS because the guy or the gal. Or, or, or the pastor preaching or the priest or the whatever, they don't know the Bible and they're not living. And then we're still, they're not living it. And so often yes. we're, we're completely ignoring the living. Do you love your children? Do you love your wife? Are you sacrificing her and living with her in an understanding way? Wait, what? Wait, where's that in here? Oh yeah, it's in here. Like, you know, you mean she just doesn't get to do whatever I want and I don't really get to do a lot. Maybe take out the trash once or twice a week excuse me, I have to actually do stuff as a husband and wives actually have to submit to their husbands, even if they don't want to, you know, and complaining and, and all this other junk that we do and just the grumbling in our hearts. Right. I mean, it's no wonder mm -hmm. we're where we're at, you know? Like, yeah. Ugh. Well, and I think that Israel was a really good example you brought up because, you know, have you ever thought about why did Israel believe in false gods in their history? It's because the cultures around them did. And the yeah. cultures that were intertwining with them did intersecting with them. And, uh, and I think that's our, the human experience is when we are surrounded by a culture, it's so easy for that to influence our thinking. And so Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yeah. So he's acknowledging there that the world around us has a mold and a conforming uh, influence that it can have on us. And we actually have to purposely be renewed in our minds and allow God to keep bringing us back to a clear perspective on what his good and perfect will is. And I would also add to all this, we need biblical, what the Bible calls wisdom, mm -hmm. right? We're, and I have to say, I, I can be guilty of it too as a Christian. We're just so quick to make judgments. It's like, can't we all just like stop and, you know, stop talking a little bit and, and actually pray <laughs> and mm. say, God, 
our culture right now is a mess. Mm. And we're one of the parts of our culture that's so bad is everybody is so quick to give an answer instead of realizing we are in such a bad state right now. We don't really have the answers. Mm. We do not have the answers in and of ourselves. What made our country great if it ever was, and I do think America has been a great country in many ways, but what has been so great about it from my point of view is God has blessed it because there have been people within our country who truly have loved the Lord and have done great things to help build up this country into what it is. And there have been churches throughout our history who have been f very faithful to the Lord. But it sometimes was through very hard things like the Civil War. Do we forget we had a Civil War? Yeah. And that can you imagine how humbling that was for people within the churches on both sides of the political situation? Yeah. There were believers in the Union. There were believers in the Confederacy. Yeah. And that was humbling. It was a reminder of how, how, how completely, you know, imperfect and in need we are as humans and then through that and there have been other ways god has humbled us i think the world wars were a very humbling experience i oh, think certainly. world war ii realizing the depths of human depravity in the holocaust realizing what it takes i think if you look at america post world war ii that was some of the strongest spiritual uh you know <laughs> Not not the only time in our country's history, but it was one of the times where people got very serious about the things of God yeah. after what happened in World War II. Yeah. And you can see it in our culture. You can see it in the movies. So the, the bottom line is it's Israel is such a good lesson for us. Paul said we learn from what was said in the scriptures. Yeah. And uh, Israel was influenced by its culture, but it also was was had a weak tendency when it became proud and self-sufficient when we have a lot that's one of the biggest dangers is as humans when we have a lot we can so easily say i don't need god i have what i need but jesus said we should be praying our father who is in heaven hallowed be your name and one of the things he says is give us this day our daily bread we we, we should realize we're not even going to have bread yeah. on our table were it not for the grace of god that's the mindset our country used to have yeah yeah no that's good i mean yeah i mean that reminds me i thought you were gonna say it um you know how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of god you know i mean because yes you just said that almost two thousand years ago right like <laughs> and how much yeah. more um I mean, we have we have so much wealth and it is i i personally and it's not really on the subject um, per se, but I personally struggle with that too, you know, in the sense of having so much and just the rights that we have as individual human beings. Um, cause I mean, I, I preached through the 10 commandments uh, several weeks back and, um, a lot of them, especially the last five in particular, uh, don't murder, right. For example, don't steal. Well, that means if I don't get to murder you, Tim, then that means you have the right to to your life to, to a degree. Right. And I don't get to steal your stuff. That means you have the right to your stuff. And so you, you take these and you actually invert them. And there's a, there's a few commentators and others that take that approach. Um, and I think a lot of times people see that and think, well, it's just because of human reason or because of it's just wrong or and they're like, well, who says what's right and wrong again, going back to Darwin and materialism, you know, if, if there's just a big bang of nothing, um, then, it doesn't really matter. You can't get mad that somebody gets killed in the streets or you can't get mad that abortion is happening or you can't get mad that elderly people die in New York state because of Cuomo or whatever. Like you can't get mad at any of that because there isn't a, you shall not murder, right? There isn't a, you know, you should treat people like you should want to be treated and so on. Um, yeah. You can't, you can't consistently be mad. It's, it's a lot like what CS Lewis points out. The fact is people do get angry People yeah. do have moral judgment is there is a more there is a moral structure to things. God has made this world in that way and it reflects his nature. And we are made in the image of God. We can't help but make yeah. moral judgments. But you're right. It doesn't it's not logically consistent. 
Yeah. When yeah, that's a better way you're to judge, it. you're judging people as if there's a morality, but you have no basis for that morality. Reminds me of a book that I wrote called God Matters. <laughs> I'm go. gonna I'm gonna plug I'm gonna go ahead and plug it, plug it. on this video. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Well, do you have any closing thoughts on this on this chapter, chapter nine? Uh, let me just see here. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do want to be positive. I don't, I feel like I've, I, you know, I can be sometimes a bit negative in my assessments of things. Uh, I, I do think when he says here, the critical social justice movement is vast. Its influence is broad and deep within the evangelical circles. And as that influence grows, it is causing some among us to make alliances we would have never forged in the past. Mm. And I think we've hit on it, but I would definitely want to be affirming the fact that we do need to look at what is influencing us as the church. And is it, is it really the scripture? Is it yeah. really that we're starting with scripture and with our time with the Lord and with our love for God and his people, or are we starting with something else? And that goes for every one of us, regardless of where you're at in terms of, you know, cultural issues or whatever, you got to take a look at ourselves. So I really appreciate that he is, he, I can tell he loves the church. Yeah. And uh, he really wants, you know, to help the church to be on the right track. So I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, no, that's good. I love that. Um, yeah, I think uh, it really, because he's dealing with a particular subject, um, he's got a lot, there's a lot less straight mm. Bible, which, you know, it's yeah. not like he's neglecting the scripture, uh, cause you can go listen to him preach or, or, or read some of his other work. But yeah, I mean, it, it really, it really, the lack of scripture application and then walking in holiness which a lot of people get all bent out of shape with, you know, especially high and mighty, you know, either ivory tower kind of guys uh, or, you know, people that automatically think, well, I'm doing this to stay saved or, you know, and then you got these different kind of aberrant views of, of different denominations and so on. It is very frustrating, but it's like, but you can't act like the world. What does the scripture say? What does it say? And then what should we do about it? Cause it's not just saying it just to say it. Right. It's not just graffiti on the wall that we drive by and we're like, I don't know, wh whatever that is. I don't know. You know, like that's some weirdo with a spray can. Like, no, God spoke this or he didn't. Like there isn't some mixed middle ground. He either did or he didn't. If he didn't, then go about your day for tomorrow. We die and eat, drink, whatever. doesn't matter. But if he did and Jesus has risen from the dead, well, then that's a massive difference. And we need mm -hmm. to know the scripture more, apply it more. Um, and and fight these battles because, you know, we can't just be like, all right, I'm starting now. And then my family's good because the world's on fire, you know, or the ship is sinking, whatever analogy you want to use. And you can't just be like, well, that's okay. You know? Uh, mm. anyway. mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. It's good stuff though. Um, yeah. I think that's it. There was, there was maybe one other thing I wanted to quote, but maybe not. I think we might have touched on it. Oh, man. Oh, one thing that did kind of strike me was him when he taught at the College of Biblical Studies in Houston, CBS. Uh, and that was it was a high level of, of black and Hispanic students that he was disappointed, it says, on 189 to find the overwhelming majority of black pastors and church leaders in my class held pro-choice positions. I considered it a win if my class was 50-50 pro-life, pro-choice split among black students. The idea that most black Christians are voting Democrat in spite of their pro-life convictions is at best an overstatement. And I think I think a lot of that, obviously, we're not part of that community, right, That that culture. Uh, we have less melanin than than uh, our friend Jason, for example. But the, it's he's kind of getting back to a lot of people already think that. And Obama being the most pro-abortion candidate in 2008, 2012, didn't really bother people. And so you kind of have people uh, in 2016 and 2020 being like, well, you know, it's fine if you don't vote for Trump because 
you know, and kind of making excuses as if all these people are pro-life. But Bauckham goes on to say further and further that they're not. They're not pro-life. And that goes into a whole kind of other can of worms of uh, fatherlessness, which is in the last chapter, um, and single parent families and just on and on and on and on. And that, you know, free sex, abortion, it's tied together. Fatherlessness, it's all tied together. And lo and behold, you have policies that continue to perpetuate that. The same people that, you know, started Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger and all that, who are also the avid racists of, uh, of yesteryear. So anyway, it's. That was I, I think I, I tend to be, you know, uh, and that's a, that I did mention something about that, how he is pointing out the change that's happened yeah. in people's singing. But but what I what I feel is these changes happen gradually. Obama is a very good example. It, when he was asked about marriage in 2008, he said marriage is between a man and a woman. And I've told I've taught at a Christian school with with high school students, and I've told them in the span of five years <laughs> that changed so much. So one of the things I do I, I I feel for is that the many people in the black community, you know, they've been strung along. I don't think where they where the Democratic Party is today is where it was years ago. Even even a decade or so ago, you know, yeah. things have changed so much. Um, so yeah, we do have to take, and that gets back to what I've been saying. We all have to be careful about being conformed to this world. And my concern to add to what he said there is, you know, I get again, why people voted for Trump over some of these other things. Um, but what does it say about where our country is at? Mm -hmm. When you have, if you actually compare Trump and everything he, he, um, you know, embodied and compare it to the scripture, I think the Republicans today are, you know, <laughs> there's a lot there. So we're all getting strung along is what I'm saying. Yeah. We're, we're all making allowances for things that we got to get back to scripture. And hopefully if we do that, and I think he is seeking to do that, it'll cause us all as Christians to come together. Because the issue is not so much whether you're Republican or Democrat. The issue is, is Jesus Lord in your life? And are you going to unite with others who Jesus is Lord in their life? We've all got to get back to that. Yeah. 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 Being that's good. That's good. Well, um, yeah. I appreciate the time. Good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll. I'll uh... This was a cool experience to be able to chat about the book it's a really good idea to do this kind of yeah. an online uh, online book club where you have discussions yeah i was hoping it, it's been i mean i've done it almost every week for the last however many weeks now uh and there's been a little it'll go um and we'll do it live but sometimes there's a lot of discussion sometimes there's not much at all but that's all right it's still out there for for people to watch and and hopefully at least yeah when you're saying when you're saying uh, people watch it that there's sometimes feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there yeah. is a lot of times people will, uh, or they'll comment back with each other, go back and forth. I've yeah. gotten a few, uh, opposing comments, uh, or sure. people, you know, why do right wingers freak out about CRT? One guy was saying something about how CRT completely lines up with the Bible, that sort of thing. And, yeah. you know, it's like, all right, well, you know, let's, I might've missed something. What's, what are the, some of the things that you miss, missed or, or that I missed or Bauckham mm -hmm. is plagiarizing or he's just doing this and this and this. Nobody gives an answer. It's been about four or five different people uh, who have had critiques so-called and they're mm -hmm. just name calling, uh, which then tells mm -hmm. me most likely that we're on the right track. So anyway. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with uh, being uh, being the person who is being criticized. Jesus said, uh, you know, be careful if all men speak well of you. Right. <laughs> oh, it's so true. That's so true. Well, I appreciate the time, brother. And uh, go check out Tim's Tim's uh, channel, A Fresh Perspective. Uh, if you haven't already, he you got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff on there. So it's good stuff. Take care, man. Appreciate it. Thank you yeah. so much. My brother. Bye. God bless.